Well, good evening. We welcome each of you to our worship services here at Ephesus Church of Christ. To those of you who have joined us online, we welcome you as well. We're about to enter our class period, and uh, I'd like to begin with a prayer this evening. Let's all bow our heads and pray. Almighty God, our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love for us, for your plan of salvation you devised even before you created the world. We thank you, Father, for the many things that you do for us every day, for life itself and our ability even together here this evening to study your word. Father, we are saddened in the passing of Brother Thomas Wales. We pray in a special way for Betty and all of that family, Father, as they deal with his loss. And we pray that you will be with all of us here at Ephesus as we deal with the loss as well. We are all sad and hearted over it, and we uh, trust, Father, that he's in good, in good hands now, and we know that uh, you are a just God, and you will take care of, of him just fine. But we do pray that you'll help us to make our way on through this life, and we look forward to the time that we can all come home and live with you in heaven when this life is over. Father, we th do thank you for this study period this evening. That as we uh, study your word, Father, we pray that you would help us to learn the lessons that you have intended for us to learn in, in, from your word and help us, Father, to properly apply it to our lives that we may grow and develop and be just the kind of people that you would have us to be. Continue to watch over us and care for us and give us wisdom, Father, in everything that we do. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're on page 22 in our book. This is part three of a series of three lessons, if you will, on how God dealt with mankind through the ages. We've already looked at the patriarchal dispensation, and part two was how God dealt with the the Jews, uh, the uh, children of Israel. And now we're in part three, which is what we normally call the Christian dispensation. Uh, as is often the case, when we come back and look at something we did years ago, we think, boy, I should have done a little different on this one. And this lesson is one of those. I'm not going to start with the book first thing tonight. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to look at just a few verses there that I wish I had in included in this lesson. Uh, I have used this passage more than once, I know, in lessons and, and so forth, so it won't be new to any of you, I don't think. But I believe it sheds some important light on what is about to happen as God transitions from the way he dealt with the children of Israel to the way he deals with us in the Christian dispensation. Uh, I'm just going to read this and we'll come in a little bit at the end. Ephesians chapter 1 beginning in verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, in Christ just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he uh, purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Before the foundation of the world, this mentions in verse 4, God already had this plan in place that he was going to use Jesus, his son Jesus, to be the one that literally would bring everything, everyone together in Christ and make us literally adopted children, that we could become children of God 
and be prepared to go and live with God when this life is over. This helps us to understand when God made that promise to Abraham that through your seed, all nations of the world is going to be, going to be blessed. And that seed was Jesus himself. This was not an afterthought, and I have heard a few times, not often, but I've heard a few times that uh, you know God sent the law of Moses, and and uh, and they they didn't keep it right. So you know God, as an afterthought, he he decided this new plan. No, that was not it at all. If anything, the law of Moses was the plan that God used to prepare things and get it ready for Jesus coming. So it's not like the law of Moses failed. It's not like the children of Israel, even though the children of Israel weren't faithful, it wasn't. It didn't mean that God didn't accomplish what he intended to accomplish with the children of Israel. God's purpose and God's will will always come to pass. Whether we try to accommodate or not, God has a way of making his will come to pass. We sometimes have trouble understanding that, but I do believe that's 100% true. But what we see is that God had this plan that he's going to send his son into this world. In Ephesians chapter 1 there, it's telling us that this was a plan and he chose us. He chose those that are in Christ, in Jesus, to be holy and blameless, to be sons of God, uh, sons by Jesus Christ, which also it mentions uh, predestined us to adoption. That we're, we're, we're adopted children. And when we look at it that way, it helps us, I believe, to realize how wonderful salvation is. When God saves us through Jesus, it, it's not because he had to. God didn't have to. God created us. He, he created us. He could destroy us any way he wanted to. He could accomplish his purpose any way he wanted to. But this is what he chose to do. So, with that in mind, that kind of leads in to Matthew chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Uh, Marge, I got you down to lead us off for the first one this morning, uh, or this, this evening. Matthew chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 says, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations from David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations and from the captivity in Babylon until, Christ, until the Christ uh, are 14 generations. Uh, we could go back in, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 1 and you can read that genealogy that leads down to uh, down to the birth of Jesus. And uh, it breaks it down very neatly in these 14 generation segments, if you will. Uh, pretty, pretty good uh, summation. But then it gets down to a man named Joseph. Was Joseph the father of Jesus? That's a loaded question. I have thought about this and I've struggled with this for many years and I don't, I'm not sure I have the answer to the question that I just asked. I, I know for a fact that Joseph was not the physical earthly father of Jesus. The Bible very explicitly says Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit we're going to see in just a minute uh, the Holy Spirit is what came upon Mary. And so she was with child from Mary. We're also going to pick up verses uh, uh, 18 and 19 between this and the next one uh, that will tie into this as well. But what we see, and if you will stop and notice, and I think this is true even today, uh, the Jews trace their genealogy through the men. Sorry, ladies, I didn't choose that, but that's what they do. And when they trace this genealogy, they go right down through there, and it got down to Joseph. And Joseph was betrothed at that time to 
to marry Mary. And I don't understand all of their customs. I don't know exactly at what point they consider the marriage, you know, final. But she's referred to him as his wife even before they, what we would think of as uh, become married. Because you notice what happened. Let's go ahead and read verses, uh, let me get my thinking straight, verses 18 and 19. Uh, that follows the verse that Marge just covered. Verse 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. It appears to me from these verses that Joseph considered himself her husband already. He does not want to make a public example of, of his wife, if you will. Uh, certainly, uh, it would be a it would be one of those situations that that would be frowned upon in the community and uh, Joseph was concerned about Mary and no doubt probably his own <coughs> reputation uh, there is a whole lot kind of rolls into this passage and, and I don't have all the answers on that but now let's go ahead with verse 20 uh, 20 and 21 Brittany, do you want to take that? All right, verses 20 and 21 uh, says, But while he, and that's Joseph, talking about Joseph, while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And notice this last phrase. For he will save his people from their sins. Joseph was concerned. He thought about putting her away. But, you know, Joseph is told. You know, the, you know, the Lord appeared to him in a dream. said, don't be afraid to take her as your wife. Uh, you know, she is conceived of the Holy Spirit. There's something very special about the situation. And of course, Joseph, there's no doubt he had, he probably, his mind probably went off in a dozen different directions here. But Joseph is being told, look, it's okay. She is, she's going to bear a child. You're going to call his name Jesus. And he's got some more information as well that will be given to him. But he's going to be the one that's going to save his people from sins. Who was Jesus' people at that point in time? What would, what would Joseph have thought when he heard that? The, uh, House, of David or the House of David, exactly. The children of Israel. The children of Israel, the very same people that were given the law. So at this point in time, I just imagine when Joseph heard that, you know, he's hearing, oh, this son that my wife is about to have is going to save our people from their sins. Uh, and we will see developments all through the rest of the New Testament, actually, as to how many of the Jews struggled with realizing this salvation is not only for us Jews, it's for everybody, and we'll see some other verses on that even in this lesson. But what we see is that plan that, that, is in, that we're given in Ephesians chapter 1 that we read earlier. This is God's plan being rolled out, and he's doing it a step at a time. And God chose to do this through Mary. And we read that Joseph was a righteous man. He was, you know, he was a God-fearing person. God, God can use righteous people and unrighteous people for his, accomplishing his will. But I, don't, I can't think of a single case where something important like the salvation of our souls is brought about by anybody besides righteous people. Righteous people are the ones that preach the gospel today. 
Righteous people are the ones that obey the gospel. Righteous people are the ones that are teaching and trying to learn and trying to figure out, now how does this apply to me? It's a righteous person, and Joseph was one of those. Uh, I think it is safe to say Joseph, in fact I know it is, Joseph was not the earthly father of Jesus from a physical standpoint. But in every other aspect, you know, he's told here, you go ahead and take Mary. You take her and you, you, you know, you, she's your wife. You take her and you do what you should do as a, as a good husband would do. And it appears, and you even read verses in the New Testament, where Jesus is referred to as the son of Joseph. Y'all remember reading some of those? Jesus was raised literally as if he was the physical son of Joseph. And I believe that's how all of this rolls in. But it's all because that's the way they looked at their genealogy. And uh, God has clearly revealed to us that this happened as a result of the Holy Spirit. And God, in his infinite wisdom, he used the Holy Spirit to do this to make this child, not just a human child. He's a, he, he was born a human, but he was God. The Holy, the Holy Spirit is one of the Godhead three. So God is accomplishing his purpose by sending his son, Jesus, down from heaven to come into this world in the form of a little bitty baby. And it's ironic that we're talking about that after we had a, a sermon on Jesus being born on Sunday, uh, or the sermon was Sunday. But what we see here is God has set the stage now. He's got this baby into the world that's going to save people from their sins, and that's a very important point. We'll see in the very next passage. Uh, Darrell, uh, Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot how about save? That it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. That passage in Isaiah was said for the children of Israel, the very same people that we talked about. They had given, been given the law. But sin is what separated Adam and Eve from God. That's why God had to back off he had you know they had to be treated differently for a while there's punishment for sin there always has been there always will be so long as the world stands and then the sin will be that sin will be punished forever but what we see here is that even with the children of Israel God is saying it's not that I can't save you I can save you. My hand's not too short to reach out and take care of you. He says it's your sins that separate us. So sin is the problem. Sin is that root cause, if you will, that caused everything else to become a problem. You know, this, the relationship with God is like, it's separated. And in order to, we're going to see in this lesson this evening, in order to reconcile us and bring us back, we needed Jesus. The children of Israel needed Jesus to bring them back so that they could be in, in good relationship with, with God. We, likewise, in fact, every person that's ever lived are reconciled to God through Jesus. And that's a really, to me, that's a really powerful lesson that if we can ever get that in mind, I mean, we, we struggle sometimes. We, we think we're supposed to be perfect, and God wants us to be perfect. Don't get me wrong. But God also knows that none of us are. That's why he sent Jesus in the first place. He said, I'm, I've got a plan, and I'm going to take care of that sin problem. And that's what he did with Jesus. So you and I, as we read these verses and we see sin is the problem, Jesus is the fix. Now we've got, to, we've got to go from there. And that's kind of where we lead into next. 
Uh, Bobby, you want to take the next one, Romans chapter 2, verses 11 through 16. It's fairly long, but we'll work our way through it here. Uh, for there is no partiality. partiality with God. For as many as have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who did not have the law by nature do the things in the law, uh, these, although not, having, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them in the day when God will judge the secrets of the men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. There's several verses there, but it's very important that we notice. God is not partial. Who was God's chosen people before Jesus came? Children of Israel. They were God's chosen people. It's it's actually, they're actually called God's chosen people. But it didn't remain that way. Because at this point, once Jesus came, God broke down that wall that was between the Jews and the Gentiles. Jews and Gentiles, you think we have uh, bitter feelings between groups today. Uh, and we do. It is certainly no worse than what the Jews and Gentiles generally felt of each other back then. They, they didn't associate with each other. But when Jesus came, he broke down that wall. And God no longer had partiality. You, know, you, you Jews are my special people. You, you, you get the law. You get all of these things that the rest of the world didn't get. When Jesus came, that kind of got... Whoosh, swept right out and now here we have God is saying and there's no partiality because notice what happened as many as have sinned under the law they're judged by the law as many that have sinned without the law uh, in this part it's kind of interesting I'll, I'll drop down verse 14 for when the Gentiles who did not have the law by nature do the things in the law these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. I mentioned in the last couple of lessons, God has always let his people know what he wants them to do. And it hasn't been the same for everybody. God didn't tell you and me to go build an ark. He did tell Noah that. God didn't tell you and me, you know, you take care of the, the Garden of Eden, because we never lived in the Garden of Eden. God has told his people in every single age, this is what I want you to do. Now, it appears for many of those Gentiles, some of it was like, some of it's second nature. And I believe to some extent that's even true today. Even people that have never studied the Bible, that never set foot in a church building or listened to a preacher preach, they have somewhat of a sense of right and wrong. Have you ever noticed that? You know, most people, you know, they think it's wrong to go kill somebody. I mean, that's just, that's just wrong. Or they think it's wrong to go take somebody else's wife. Or they think it's wrong to go rob a bank. Now, that doesn't mean some of them don't do all of those things. But there's a certain sense of right and wrong. And I believe by nature, God has told all of these people down through the years, this is what I want you to do. This is what's right. And you shouldn't do these other things because they're wrong. And so by nature, they did those things. And, and it says that became a law to themselves. So even the Gentiles who didn't have that law of Moses, the law of Moses was very detailed, went down into all of these, these little points that you've got to do this and you can't do that and you've got to do this at a certain time and you've got to do that at a certain time. You know, the law of Moses was very, very detailed. But that doesn't mean the Gentiles didn't know what God wanted them to do either. 
God revealed to them, and, and we do have record. There are cases where God dealt with the patriarchs. Remember the patriarchal dispensation? God dealt with the patriarchs, and he said, this is what I want you to do. And, and they were the leaders of their family. So they, in turn, told their family, this is what we need to do to please God. And this was going on with the Gentiles all through those years that the children of Israel were under the law of Moses. So it's almost like all this was going on at the same time. The Gentiles were doing one thing, the Jews were doing something else. But they were both doing what God asked them to do, if they were faithful. And obviously there were exceptions in all of those, just like it is today. But I do think it's worth noting here that their conscience either bore witness it was, the conscience did bear witness. It either accused them or excused them. It said, you're doing right or you're doing wrong. And all of us, when you stop and think about what your conscience does, that's exactly what it does. And it's based on what we've been taught. You know, if you've been taught, you know, you do this and this and this, you know, when you do that, your conscience says, you did good, you did good. Keep on doing it. That's a good thing. You did good. When we do something wrong, What's the conscience say? Eh, you shouldn't have done that. And usually, uh, if, if we got a really good conscience, we get ready to go to bed at night and we can't hardly get to sleep because we remember all that bad thing I did and, and that's our conscience you know, accusing us. I believe that's the way God was doing those Gentiles all through those years when they were dealing with you know, their own thing while the children were under the law of Moses. But that conscience, that same conscience works the same way today. And that's why we can understand this because the conscience didn't go away just because the law of Moses was taken out. That's another story in and of itself. But notice the secrets are, are the, when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to the Gospels. When God sent Jesus, he sent him to the Jews and to the Gentiles every person. It doesn't matter who they are. doesn't matter where they came from. He sent Jesus to take care of that problem of sin that we just talked about. So now we have a fix for the problem. All right, Romans 3, 21 to 26, Diane. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, to all who, uh, uh, yeah, all who believe, I kind of skipped a couple of words there, but uh, to, uh, to, all on, on, to all and on all who believe, uh, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Let's stop there because I'm going to hit perpetuation a little bit harder here in just a minute. What we see here, this clearly says that it's the ones that believe in Jesus Christ. He says there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. We're not worried about that anymore. It's the ones that believe in Jesus. This is, this is what's going to justify us through the grace of God. Now, grace is a whole subject we could spend probably a week talking on, on grace and I don't claim to be the expert on it but it, you know I, I like to think of grace and mercy this way God has extended his grace and mercy to us grace is when he gives us something we didn't deserve you know we didn't deserve to have our sins forgiven but God gave it to us anyway mercy is when I did something bad and I should be punished terribly for it you know I have sinned and really you know, sin, the, the penalty for sin is death. So that means I should die for my sin. But God had mercy on me. And he sent Jesus to pay the price for that sin. So now I don't have to suffer death for my sin. But it's all because God extended his grace to all of us. He's, he's given us something. We, we'll never deserve it. You know, even the best person on this earth, and there's nobody perfect. But even the best person on this earth does not deserve salvation. We don't deserve the hope of heaven when this life is over. 
But God has made this extended to every one of us. And it doesn't matter who we were, who we are, where we live, what the color of our skin is, and who our parents were, none of that matters. It's who believes in Jesus and we'll see later who obeys Jesus. Very important. All right, Diane, we'll continue verse 25. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And I put in brackets there, propitiation is the process of reconciling us with God and appeasing him. You remember sin is the, the problem. That's what separates us from God. But Jesus is the propitiation that reconciled us brought us back to God that is powerful if when we stop and let it sink in and realize look what God has done and he did it through that son Jesus that was promised back to Abraham way back then in fact it was even God even promised it before the end of the world that was his plan back when we read there in Ephesians that we just started the class with this was not an afterthought. It was God's plan. And it's very important that we realize this propitiation came about by Jesus' blood. I have never seen a sacrifice offered the way they did under the law of Moses. But I can tell you the Jews that were under the law of Moses, they knew what that meant. They had certain sacrifices that they were to offer and they, they would cut their throat and they would let the blood out and they would use that blood to sprinkle on certain places and they did some things that to us just sounds very barbaric. But it was shedding the blood. The Jews understood the value of the blood because life is in the blood and that's mentioned in the New Testament as well. When Jesus died on the cross, he shed his blood for you and for me. That is how the propitiation, if you will, took care of that sin problem. That paid the price for my sins and your sins. When we believe in Jesus and we do what he has said, that brought us back together. It reconciled us to God. And it's so important to realize we are reconciled to God through Jesus, not because I'm so good, I did so good, I, I, you know, I did this or I did that. No, it don't matter what you did. It's what Jesus did. That's what brought us together. And it's so important. Uh, Eric, Romans 5, verses 1 through 11. I know our time's running close. I'm going to try to finish this one. Uh, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have access by faith in the grace or in this grace yeah grace uh, which, in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of, of the glory of God and not only that but we also glory in tribulations knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who, has, who was given to us. For when we were still uh, without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for, uh, it should be for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still Sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, 
much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in, uh, in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. That, that propitiation became our reconciliation. Jesus became our reconciliation. But I want you to notice a couple of things there. We're justified by faith. If you don't believe it, you don't have the faith. I mean, you, you, don't, you don't receive the benefit. Ooh. I thought it went dead on me. Uh, but by faith, we're justified. We're, that means, you know, we're made to stand just inside of God. Not because we did something really good. It's because of what Jesus did. He paid the price. He's the propitiation for it. And it gave us peace with God. Peace can be looked at in a lot of different ways. But the best peace you and I can ever have is to be at peace with God. Our sins are taken away. We're not having to worry about that anymore. We're, we're trying to live for him every day. And we, we're trying to do the things that pleases him. And oh, when we do that, you remember the conscience we talked about a little bit ago? The conscience says you're doing good. You're doing good. Keep on doing that. That's a good thing. I believe that all of that rolls into the peace that we have with God. And God designed us that way. God gave us that conscience to encourage us, to help us to know when we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. But I also want to notice there in uh, verse 8 that Christ died for the ungodly. Who are the ungodly? How many have sinned? Romans 3.23, every one of us. Christ died for every single one of us. And we may want to point fingers and say, that person's really bad, or that person's really bad. And, oh, look here, I'm, I'm trying to do what's right. I'm okay. I'm, I'm doing fine. No. I like to use this example. I've probably used it in front of a lot of people. Rocky, I'm going to pick on you right now. I'm going to say, Rocky, look look at all these sins you've done, these things you've done. I've got one finger pointed at Rocky. How many fingers have I got pointed at myself? One, two, three. That was shooting up somewhere out in the sky. I like to look at it this way. I may point fingers at somebody else. Shame on me because I got three fingers coming back at me. I need to be looking at me. And I need to be looking at the sins that I've done. And what do I need to do to do what God has wanted me to do? And that's how we... We, let our, we, we take care of our conscience. We do things that our conscience says, this is what you need to be doing. And if we've taught ourselves correctly, if we've studied God's word, and we read these things and we say, oh, that applies to me, that's what I'm going to do. Then all of a sudden it all comes together because we are justified in Christ Jesus. We do that and his blood takes away the things... So we don't need to point fingers at somebody else that says, oh, they're the ungodly. No, the ungodly is us. The ungodly is me. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's another pretty important thing. You and I, we would struggle to go die for our enemies. We would probably struggle to die for anybody. But can you imagine... Jesus died on the cross. He was nailed to the cross by the very people, number one, that accused him and caused him to be put there in the first place, those leaders of the Jews. But he also died for the very ones that drove those nails in his hands and his feet. He died for everyone. When Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That ought to just really just rip our hearts out. How could Jesus do that? He did it just exactly this way. Because while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. He, he's taken care of that problem of sin. And it's, it's so powerful. I, I, I know y'all can tell. I get emotional on this. Because I believe that is exactly what we should do when we realize 
what Jesus did. And when we study things like this and we think, well, we're reconciled, we're made back in peace with God because Jesus shed his blood. His life literally ran out of his body. And he died on the cross so that you and I can have our sins gone. We fixed the problem. No, we didn't fix the problem. Jesus fixed the problem. And so it's easy for us to look back on the sidelines and, and think, oh, look what I've done, when really all we need to do is just back up and say, nope, not what I've done. It's what Jesus did. He is the propitiation for my sins and for your sins. And that is a good place to stop. Lord willing, next week we'll take up with Romans 6, verses 1 through 18. And Renee, if you don't mind, we'll start with you next week. I don't always say this, but if y'all have questions during, during these discussions, sometimes I get wound up. Y'all can tell that. But some of these subjects I do get wound up on. Uh, I, it, I take it really personal, and I hope you do too. And if you get really personal and you want to talk about something, let it be known. We'll talk about it. Uh, this is a very flexible class. Uh, as I have mentioned at the beginning of this class, I keep finding stuff that I wish I had put in these lessons. I'm, I'm, you know, if there ever is a, a new draft of this thing, I, I suspect it'll... It'll be a thicker book than what this is. I, you know, I'm not taking stuff out. I'm adding stuff in. Anyway, thank you all very much.
Good evening. First song will be number 841. <clears throat> if the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue.
the Apostle Peter said we are to be ready to give an answer for the reason of the hope we have within us. Today I had an interesting challenge related to that. At night I'd gone shopping a little while and uh, I, as normally do, don't go in the stores with her. I like to find me a bench somewhere and sit down. And so I did, but it started getting cold, so I thought, well, I'll go in. Uh, and so, no, actually, so I think she came to the door and called me. She wanted to show me something. So anyway, I went in the store, and when I went in, she said, I'm glad you're in here because this guy's quoting scripture, and you need to get in this discussion. Uh, and he had quoted, and I don't even know what all had transpired before I went in, but they had got to talking about the Bible and various things related to it. And he quoted from 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, uh, where he said that uh, where Paul says that we're to study, show yourself approved to God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And this guy was really making a, a, a point, a, an important point, that we uh, rightly divide the word of God, that, that you have to rightly divide it if you're going to understand it. And you're not going to understand it if you don't rightly divide it. And, and of course, Diane said, well, where do you go to church? And he, t he told him, he said, I'll tell you what, they don't always rightly divide it either. Uh, he said, you, you've got to rightly divide it. Well, I got in there, and we got to talking and, and so on. And, and uh, we, we began talking about how one becomes a Christian and what the Bible teaches and so on. And, of course, we didn't agree on some of the things about that. And uh, as we were discussing it, he said, well, that's where rightly dividing it comes in. He said, you have to understand that the New Testament is a transition book. And he said, as far as we are concerned, where I go to church, he said, we only live by the letters written by Paul. He said, the gospel is under the Old Testament and the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And all of that is a transition. The book of Acts is a transition from Jews to Gentiles coming in. And so none of that really affects us today or our thinking or our, our salvation. You have to read just what Paul says in order. And he said James was writing to Jews, so that doesn't count. Uh, and so he, he basically, he, he took out everything except what Paul wrote. And that's everything, well, he said you got to rightly divide it. And that's the way you got to rightly divide it. And so I, of course, had a problem with his divisions and how he was dividing it, and we discussed that a little bit. And, um, but, but I found that interesting because what that told me is that here's a guy that, that I have no question in my mind that he's as sincere as I am. And he's studying and he's trying to figure out how to understand what God said, and yet we're coming to different conclusions because we're using different methods of interpretation, different methods of of, of dividing the scripture as to how it applies to us and what applies and so on. And, and I think, and, and I'm not sure where he came up with what he came up with. I've, in my years of preaching and teaching and talking with people, I have never, ever run into this before. This is the first for me. Uh, so I have no idea where he came up with this or how he came about reaching these conclusions. Uh, but we, we got into a discussion of baptism, and of course, that was, he said, he said I knew if y'all was Church Christ, we was going to get into this one, uh, and uh, so, and I didn't correct him about being Church Christ, I, I just let that one slide, but uh, you know how I feel about that, but anyway, we, uh, as we were talking about baptism, uh, I said, well, you can go to the book of Acts, and this is how the division part came up, I said, you can go to the book of Acts, and I said, Every single person that's converted to Christ is baptized in Christ. He said, well, that, that book doesn't count. Uh, he said, that's the transition. That doesn't deal with us. And I said, well, Paul said that as many of you as are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And so you have to be baptized into Christ. And, and I said, that tells me then that it is the point of baptism. When we go into Christ, that's when we become a Christian. And he never really responded to that one. He just simply said, well, we're going to have to agree to disagree. Uh, and, and we left it at that. But we need to be careful, I think. Uh, number one, we need to know what we believe and why we believe it. Uh, we need to understand Scripture as to why 
it says what it says, how it fits, how it applies. And I do believe he's right in one thing. We need to rightly divide it. I think he's wrong in his divisions of it. Uh, but we need to rightly divide it. And we need to think about that. And we need to be ready to give an answer. Uh, we never know when we're going to have an opportunity to talk with somebody. And, and you never know sometimes... A seed is planted just simply by discussion like what we had today, and, and it might cause him to, to think about it. It may cause him to study it some more, and he has our phone number. Who knows? He may even call me one day. Uh, but, but I think that we, we need to be ready to try to defend what we believe and show from Scripture why we believe what we believe. And, and I have to admit, it caught me sort of off guard. I wasn't expecting that today when I went in that store. Uh, and so we do need to be be ready to do that. He went on to say that, and he he was he was talking about grace, and he said we're saved just by grace. That's it. He says nothing that we do at all. He said a lot of people say you have to repent. He said that's a work you don't have to repent. Uh, repentance comes after you're saved, which is not an uncommon teaching. I've heard that a lot of times. So. Uh, but but I but and so he said certainly baptism would be a work that you don't have to do that in order to be saved. But I think if if we look at what Paul wrote, Romans chapter six, he says that we as Jesus died and was buried and rose again, he said we die with him to sin, we are buried in baptism. And we're raised to walk a new life. And, and I, I quoted that to him. And the fact is, we don't begin that new life until we're raised up from baptism. That's the point in, in time in which we are. And, and baptism is a response of our faith. It is a, a gift. Our salvation is a gift of God. It's not earning anything. It's just simply saying, I believe that I need to do what God told me to do. And he told me to turn away from my sin and repentance. He told me to be baptized into Christ. And when I do that, Peter says, then baptism saves us, not as a uh, worker, not as a removing the dirt from the flesh, but an answer of a good conscience. We know we did what God told us to do, and therefore we know that we've been saved. Tonight, if you're here and you're not a Christian, we certainly would urge you to accept the gospel as it's taught in the New Testament. And come to Jesus as we stand and sing this song. Zion's call sweetly rings over land and sea, bidding us look to realms above. While the light from the throne shines for you and me, let us listen to the call of
Thomas Clay passed away Monday night. Uh, and his uh, service will be tomorrow at Limestone Chapel. Visitation uh, begins at 10, 11 to 1.45. Okay. I knew there was a 45. From 11 to 1.45, funeral will be at 2 o'clock uh, at Limestone Chapel. We certainly want to remember Betty and that family in our prayers. Uh, and continue to pray for them. Are there any other announcements? That Okay. Uh, Bruce, you got to close the prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for all this many blessings. Thank you for bringing us out here tonight to study another portion of your word and sing songs and praise your name. Lord, tonight we uh, we come to you with heavy hearts as the loss of Thomas, uh, as he was such a good blessing through the years. Uh, please let us all be that shining light as he was. Please be with uh, Betty and the rest of his family as they go through this time. Uh, be with them and keep them. As we're about to be separated, Lord, go with us. God, guard and direct us. In the end, we've been found faithful. Please give us home with in heaven. Please forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. How you doing? Hey man, I'm doing alright. How are you? I'm doing good. Doing well. Yeah. Up for high. Up for high. Yeah. You don't. Know, you don't realize how do you get the more you really. <laughs>